Boa noite a todos. É, a gente vai começar hoje, então, uma edição especial aqui do ERINEPM, que a gente sempre faz a reunião pela manhã, mas é, especialmente pelo professor Carral, a gente marcou nesse horário para a gente poder assisti-los. É um prazer imenso tê-lo aqui. A gente já estava conversando um pouquinho. Eu vou passar agora a palavra para o doutor Jonatas, que é, que é nosso fellow aqui de rinologia, e ele ficou com o professor Carral há um tempo lá, para começar os trabalhos. Então, Jonatas, pode começar, por favor. Obrigado, professor. Falar rapidamente português também. Boa noite para todos. É um prazer para a gente aqui da Escola Paulista ter todos aqui. É, o doutor Carral é uma sumidade em cirurgia de base de crânio. Ele é chefe do, do setor de otorrinolaringologia na Ohio State University. E é chefe do setor de rinologia e base de crânio também. Além de chefiar um dos laboratórios de secção de base de crânio mais avançados do mundo, que é o Outvision. Uh, speaking a little bit in English, Dr. Carral, uh, I know you understand a little bit of Portuguese, but uh, it's a pleasure for us to have you here. It's an honor. Thank you for uh, accepting the invitation. Uh, Dr. Carral is the head of the otolaryngology and head and neck department at Ohio State University, and also the head of the rhinology and school-based surgery department. So it's an honor for, for us to have you here, and uh, uh, you have the show now. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I apologize, but my Portuguese is not good enough for the conference. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give it in English. I, actually, even in Spanish, it's hard for me to give a, like, a, a medical lecture. And that's, that's my first language. Um, so I'm going to start sharing here. Um, we, we, we have a, a, a group that is manageable in the sense that if you want to interrupt and, and, and comment or question or or anything, we can do it. That way it's kind of informal and, and we can make it a little bit more interactive and interesting for everybody. Okay. Uh, so let's just start sharing the talk here. Uh, we, we picked the subject of complications and I'm gonna cover uh, the main three. Um, basically, I'm gonna cover CSF leaks and uh, vascular injury, especially carotid injury. And uh, talk a little bit about the orbit and maybe the sinonasal tract. Uh, so uh, before I start into the meat of the matter, uh, I think that it's uh, useful to talk about complications in general. And this is true not only for skull-based complications, but for any surgical complications. Uh, we can divide those complications in errors of judgment uh, that you can see, you can read in the slide there, technical issues that is basically mistakes that we make in surgery. Uh, mistakes of communication or, or things that we don't have a, really a good explanation, uh, what we refer to acts of God. Uh, for the most part, I'm going to refer to technical complications because those are, are easier to understand and easier to predict and they are easier to prevent. Uh, so as I mentioned, mainly I'm going to concentrate in CSF leak, bleeding and orbital complications. Uh, by the way, the, the complications of endoscopic sinus surgery, if I can go back for a second, are really the same of open skull base surgery. The incidence of these complications may vary a little bit, but they're really the same. Uh, and of course, there are other complications that I don't have in this list that are important, but we're going to concentrate in these three. Uh, so principles of manage management, I think that prevention, it sounds like a cliche, you, you hear it everywhere. But it's true. Uh, the, the anticipation of, of potential problems during the surgery leads to better planning and leads to avoiding the, the potential problems. So I always say that you have to have a plan uh, in, in, to, to avoid the, the, a problem, but you also have, you need a backup plan. So you need a plan A and a plan B and a plan C, et cetera, et cetera because you just never know what is going to happen in the surgery. Some things are completely unpredictable. Uh, so the other thing that, that I uh, always emphasize is that you have to think when you have a complication uh, about what you're going to do, because a, a major complication is rarely the result of a single event. It's usually the result of a complex array of different events that leads to a major complication. So the bottom line is that you have to think before you do something, because instead of solving the problem, you can make it worse. And of course, after you, you have a complication or even better after somebody else have a complication, 
it's better to go and analyze it and try to learn from it so you don't repeat it again. So in endoscopic sinus surgery, we have an interesting phenomenon, the phenomenon of disorientation. And of course, we can get disoriented in the surgical field because we don't recognize the anatomy correctly. Uh, and we know that the anatomy really doesn't change, but the way that you look at it and the perspective of the anatomy can change. So that leads to mistakes in orientation. The other mistakes in orientation is due to the distortion or extreme magnification of, of, the, of the endoscope. So if you get very close to a certain field and you turn the camera around, you have no way of telling what is the, 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 the head of the patient and what is the, the feet of the patient. So this is a unique scenario. There's no other surgical situation where you have that problem. It would, you, you don't have that problem during open surgery. You don't have that problem during microscopic surgery. You are always oriented to where the head of the patient is. But in endoscopic sinus surgery, especially with the angle scopes, uh, you can turn the camera around and what you think is the, the, the head, it may be the feet, et cetera, et cetera. And that can lead to potential complications. Uh, so the lack of, of depth perception and the lack of, of again, the, the change in the orientation can lead to significant mistakes. So I, I always use the example of these two tables. Here's Danny Prevedello in the back holding the table. And he's holding those two tables at the different angle. Of course, they are at different distance, just like this, this diagram with the two tables. Well, uh, the, the two tables are just completely uh, the same. They are, they are identical. Uh, however, your eyes will perceive it as different. The other thing that I always emphasize to my trainees is that your eyes will not see what your brain doesn't know. So if you know, don't know of certain anatomical structure, you won't be able to, to, know, to identify. If you don't know that it exists, uh, it will be too late by the time that you learn that there's something new there. So uh, let's, let's go and start talking about CSF leaks. We know that the defects that we create with endoscopic sinus surgery, endoscopic skull base surgery, not sinus surgery, um, are different from the, from the defects that we were treating in the 1990s of iatrogenic defects and defects from trauma. They, they are larger and they have other, other factors associated with it that make it more difficult to repair. So here's a, an example. Here, here's a surgery where we open the third ventricle, the mother load of CSF. So you can expect that if you open this big, big cavity here, uh, the ventricle, or open a couple of cisterns, the chance that you're going to have a post-operative CSF leak is much higher than if you do not. So again, many other factors. Habitus of the patients, unfortunately, uh, you know that in the States we have this uh, obesity epidemic, and especially in the Midwest here in Ohio, uh, we have this type of patient very commonly. So morbidly obese uh, is uh, associated with increased intracranial pressure, uh, and that will cause some other trouble uh, for, from the standpoint of CSF leak. So before we go into te techniques, uh, I, we, we have to understand that uh, the use of vascularized tissue in, in general is superior to the use of grafts. And that is a very, it's a very intuitive concept. If you bring something that has its own blood supply, that doesn't rely on the other tissues for the blood supply, it, it is more likely to survive than if you do not, that if you use a, a graft that is not vascularized. So here's a systematic review published by Richard Harvey, in which he basically suggested very strongly that the, the use of flaps uh, is advantageous over the use of grafts. That's not to say that we use grafts for everything, uh, we, because we do not, uh, the, sorry, flaps for everything, because we do like the grafts. I, I like grafts for small defects, I, I like grafts for cellular and paracellular defects, and the same a small defects that we have been reconstructing since the 1990s. Traumatic, spontaneous, idiopathic, CSF leaks, they do very well with grafts. You don't have to use a flap for that. But for the big defects, the flaps are advantageous. And again, that's not to say that you cannot do it in other ways, but if you take all the numbers, you're gonna do better and more reliable with a flap. So uh, the other thing that we have to recognize that uh, the, the, if you take these patients back to the operating room, 
uh, and repair the, the defect, the post-operative CSF leak quickly, the chance of meningitis is very small. So even at times where we had a very in high incidence of CSF leaks, our, our incidence of meningitis was really very low, was less than 2%. And that's because we were treating these, these leaks very aggressively. We would take them to the operating room very quickly and try to repair it. So in, in general, most of our skull-based defects are reconstructed with a flap. And the, the most common one is the Haddad flap that I'm sure you are all familiar with it by this point. Uh, but even in the, we, with the use of flaps, we can have certain problems. Uh, problem number one is that you can kill the flap uh, by the use of different instrumentation. And here uh, we have an illustration that shows the flap going into the nasopharynx, so we, we like to keep it sometimes. And when we do that, we, we have this, this elbow or this uh, anterior pedicle of the flap that is very vulnerable to the instruments. And, and trust me, we have seen all of these that, that are listed in the, in the slide. We have seen damage uh, from the drilled, from the micro debrider, from kerosene rondure, you name it. Uh, even if you don't do that, uh, you also can, can damage the flap by just putting it in a place where it gets congested or it gets compressed. Uh, for example, uh, when we go to the clivals or the nasopharynx, we used to put the flap in the maxillary sinus, or even if you put it in the nasopharynx, sometimes it gets swollen and it gets congested. And if you don't pay attention and take it out once in a while, that flap is gonna get so congested that the blood supply is gonna stop and the flap is gonna die. It's gonna become ischemic and it's not gonna be very useful. Uh, the flaps are not definitely not magical. They have their, their learning curve. Um, the peri you, have, you know that the flap will have a mucosal side and a periosteal side. If the periosteal side should not be exposed to air, meaning that the, the periosteal side should be in opposition to some type of, of rough surface at all times, so it heals against the bone or it heals against some surface. If you leave it exposed to air, uh, what will happen is that the flap is going to heal by secondary intention, intention and that will create contraction. So by contracting, it may pull the paddle of the flap away from the defect and you may get a CSF leak. All other things that we have seen is that the way that we repair the, the, the defect, even when we talk about the flap, is really still a multi-layer technique. We like to use a collagen matrix or fascia either in the subdural or the epidural space. And then we put the flap as an only below the skull base. So what happens at the hole, really at the defect here, is not really that important in the sense that I have seen all kinds of, of techniques using cartilage and bone and mesh and whatever. It, it really doesn't matter what you put in there. However, it, what happens around the defect, that does matter because that's what is gonna seal the defect is the healing of the, of the flap against the skull base. So if you put something in between the two, you're gonna delay the healing. And that can be bone wax, uh, glue of any kind, anything that separates the vascular tissue from the vascular tissue is it, gonna impair the healing. And also, of course, it's gonna be more so if you're using a graft, uh, but even the flap, you're gonna impair the healing and you may, get, you may have a problem. So, just to give you a little bit more of, a, of an example, just imagine that this is the clivals and we're looking in, into the axial view. Sometimes the, cli the clival tunnel is so, so deep that you cannot use the flap all around and bring it on the other side to contain the defect. So in these instances, what we do is we fill up the, the, the tunnel with fat. So that doesn't violate the, the principle that I told you before, because again, what happens in the defect is not that important. What happens around the defect, which is where the flap is gonna heal and seal it, that is important. So again, avoid anything that separates vascular tissue, the skull base from the vascular tissue from the flap. Anything in between is really not a good idea. All other things that we have seen that, deal, that, that can cause a CSF leak are dead spaces. So septations of the sinus, just imagine that this is this is either a sagittal view or, a, or an axial view of the sphenoid sinus. And you're gonna put your pedicle uh, coming this way and the flap in opposition with the walls. If you lose these septations, you always have these little corners and dead spaces. 
that the flap is not going to cover and the CSF uh, may escape into them and deal with a CSF leak. The same with the corners of the sinus. You, you have to put the flap in opposition to those corners uh, so it conforms to all the surface. In the past, we, we advocated the use of a Foley catheter, but I, I, I was not a fan of the Foley catheter and I, I stopped using it except for very special cases. And the reason I don't like the Foley catheter is that you see that it's round and there's nothing in the skull base that has that shape. So what we had to do is that you have to put some other material uh, that conforms to the Foley catheter and transmit the pressure to the Foley catheter to whatever you want to transmit it. Uh, the other issue that the Foley catheter has is that most of the pressure is that the is at the equator of the Foley cath of the of the balloon, and you have very little pressure at the poles like you have here. If the pressure at the equator is greater than 25 milli millimeters of mercury, that's the capillary perfusion pressure. You're gonna basically call, cause ischemia. So if that is close to the pedicle of the flap, you're gonna kill the flap. So for the most part. Uh, we use metal cell packing, that's expandable sponges. You can do the same thing with regular nasal packing, uh, but we use it, we like the sponges. So we, the idea is not to put too much pressure on, on the flap. So I, here you have an example, and, and here you see at the end of the surgery, we're trying to make sure that the flap is against the surfaces of the bone and that we're covering every single uh, fold, every single corner, that we don't have any dead spaces uh, around the flap. You can see here that we're checking the corners, making sure again that nothing, there's no, no dead space. So at the time of bolstering the flap, either with packing or with Foley catheter, or whatever you are using, uh, you have to make sure that you don't overpack or underpack. So you, here you have, this is a hybrid packing. This is using a balloon. Uh, but at the same time, you have metal cells or, 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 or sponges at the top. And here, the, the, the flap has been underpacked. You can see here that it's sagging like a hammock. And here has been overpacked. They, basically, the, the two uh, have the same effect. And thus, they, they displace this anterior part of the flap posteriorly. And if you displace it posteriorly long enough, you can cause this other type of problem where the flap all of a sudden is inside the cranial cavity instead of below the skull base. This particular case, we were able to identify that situation before the patient actually had a CSF leak. You can, you can see the amount of packing that is below. Uh, so we had to take in the patient back to the operating room and correct it. Again, we did it before he even uh, developed a CSF leak. So usually we don't do a post-operative MRIs on all the patients, but these are oncologic resections. And in the oncologic resections, we do the, the post-operative MRIs in, in the first 24 hours. We do it with contrast. Uh, so we do it for mostly to ascertain that we did a good job with the tumor resection, but we also look at the position of the flap and the, and the, the, and the vascularization of the flap. So if you have a flap that doesn't take contrast, that may be a flap that you want to observe uh, a little bit with more detail, a little bit closer. So here you have basically the learning curve of the flap and how it has evolved. This was uh, uh, data collected by Adam Sanation that used to be, he was a fellow at, at, at Pittsburgh. Uh, so here you have basically more or less the numbers that, that remain to this day. Uh, they have continued to trend down, but it is, they're basically the same. Overall, we have a CSF leak of about 3% or so, uh, but for high flow, and, and by high flow, I define a high flow leak, not really by the volume of liquid that you see coming down. We define a high flow as a, as a leak that comes from the third ventricle or a leak that associated uh, to the dissection of at least two cisterns. So that's a high flow leak. Uh, so for a high flow leak, it's about six to 7%. And you can see here that when we fail, uh, the technical errors are the most common cause, followed by increased ICP, increased intracranial pressure, followed by inadequate healing, followed by poor compliance. So even when we, we would like to blame the patients that they don't follow the instructions for the post-operative CSF leak, in reality, 
uh, is something, the great majority of the time, is something that happened in surgery that we made a mistake. So post-operative care of these patients is, is of course key. I'm not gonna dwell too much on this because uh, I think that this is something that is more or less uniform around the world. Uh, we, we give instructions to the patients about not lifting any weight, not straining, not blowing their nose, et cetera. Uh, use of, of, we don't use uh, drains very frequently. We only use uh, lumbar spinal drains uh, for patients that have a recurrent CSF leak. Uh, however, in, in cases that I'm not too sure that the flap is completely adequate, in cases that maybe uh, I suspect that they may have increased intracranial pressure, uh, I use acetazolamide for five to seven days. Uh, sometimes we use Lasix that does the same thing. Basically, they, they stop the production or they reduce the production of CSF and therefore they reduce the intracranial pressure. So um, without any more ado, we, we will jump into neurovascular complications, especially the carotid injury. And, and the idea is that you don't want to end up with a mass like this. If you're doing an endoscopic procedure, you look at the monitor and it's like that. So we really need to identify uh, those factors that can lead uh, to a CSF leak. So you need to identify uh, danger areas. Um, so we know that the hesences of the internal carotid canal happen in about uh, 15%. We know that poor pneumatization of the sinus uh, can lead to disorientation within the sinus itself. It's more, definitely more difficult to identify the surgical landmarks. Uh, here's a summary from different anatomical studies. We know that the carotid bulges into the sphenoid sinus, especially in the paracellar area in, in most of the, of, of the patients. And this particular area is also very commonly the hissant. So you have uh, there two factors, a bulging of the carotid, the hissants that will contribute uh, to a, an injury in this area. And in fact, this is the most common site of injury uh, for the carotid. The other factor that contributes to this is that, again, the, the endoscopic view is bidimensional. You lose the depth perception. And most of us will concentrate on the paraclival carotid that is here. Well, that paraclival carotid can be two centimeters behind this area here. In other words, the, these are, this is much more anterior. And if you judge by the paraclival carotid, when you move up, you will get into the carotid uh, because you were not expecting it. Uh, and of course, we have uh, some morphologic changes with different pathologies like acromegaly where the carotids can come closer. Uh, this study by, by, by when we were in Pittsburgh also, and this was done by Juan uh, Fernandez Miranda. And basically th this, is a, this was not a new, uh, a new finding, but he, he did a very good job uh, emphasizing the fact when you have se different septations in the sphenoid, most of the time those septations are not midline. It's actually rare to find a midline septation. Most of the time, both the intra and inter sinus septations I uh, end up in the carotid canal, in the optic canal, or in both, like you have here. So that is very, very common. Uh, the the, the, the take-home message on this is that you have to be very careful when you're removing those septations and not to be aggressive in fracturing the septations because you can cause a, a fracture of the, of the carotid canal. So we know, and this is in, also intuitive, that when we move in the coronal plane, you will have more vascular complications. And that, that's intuitive because the coronal plane implies that you will pass the carotid laterally. And so if you're gonna do that, if you're gonna go beyond the goals, the goalposts of the carotid, it makes sense that you will have a greater chance of injury. So in this list is what I, what I define as very high risk factors. So very high risk factors is a, when you're doing a radical resection of a tumor that is adherent to the carotid, when you have a tumor that is inside, encircling the carotid more than 120 degrees, well, what happens in these two is that the tumor is probably gonna be uh, a, 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 not just adjacent to the carotid, but it's gonna be glued to the carotid and trying to take it out is very likely to result in an injury. Lesions that require wide exposure of the carotid is also a, 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 a risk factor. And of course, patients that have prior injury of the carotid either by surgery or by radio, radio surgery, 
or but some other type of high energy radiation, uh, you're more likely to, to get in, into the carotid. <clears throat> so we, we won't dwell too much on this, but there are anatomy related risks that we have discussed already. We have pathology related risks that we, some of which we have discussed. We know that carotid injuries are more common in chondroid tumors like chondrosarcomas and chordomas. And, and there are some issues regarding the technique. Imaging is critical in all these patients because both the CTA and an MRI uh, will give you complementary information regarding soft tissues and bone, and that will help you to have a map that is accurate. And if you have a navigation system available, you can use them in your navigation system and avoid an injury to, to the carotid. Now, an injury to the carotid can, can cause any of the things that you see here. Uh, we always think of a stroke, we think of death, uh, and we think of maybe if we're lucky, nothing happens. So uh, the incidence of a carotid injury has been calculated from anywhere from one in, in, in 500 to one in, in 80. Uh, I think that the incidence is very likely to be underestimated uh, because the people that, that publish about this are the people that have big numbers and are the people that actually have uh, good experience and they don't have carotid injuries very commonly. Uh, for those that ha have a carotid injury every 10 cases, though, they usually do not publish the series. So therefore the incidence uh, is probably higher than what we have in the literature. So how to, what to do to prevent a catastrophe? Not only to prevent just the, the injury, but to be prepared in case that the injury happens. Well, first of all, uh, we make sure that the blood is available, uh, blood, blood for blood transfusions. And I'm not talking about ordering blood or doing a type and cross. What I'm talking about is really having the blood available in the operating room that you see it, you know it's there, you know that it is ready to go in case you need it. Uh, we do, a, in some cases, we do a cervical prep or we do a neck uh, carotid control. This is especially true when I do a nasopharyngectomy where I may actually dissect the carotid in the neck, put a control, and then dissect the internal carotid up and protect it with either cottonoids or some type of, of protective uh, material. So when I come from the nasal cavity, when I do it in esophagectomy, instead of finding the carotid, I find the cottonoids or the protective material and I avoid an injury. We usually uh, prepare the thigh uh, and the thigh is prepared in case we need a muscle patch. Uh, you can get muscle from other areas. You can get muscle from the belly. Uh, I have seen muscle taken out from the neck. Uh, I think that's a little bit more difficult. The problem with the belly is that if you have an, an aging patient, maybe the muscles are not that, that prominent. And of course, if you go too deep, you can get in the bowel and you can have a complication. Going into the neck is not an easy thing when you have two surgeons trying to control the carotid, you have to have another hands come around it. Usually the neck is not prepped. Uh, it is difficult to get to it. So again, it's not that easy. Uh, I have seen some other crazy things like trying to get muscle from the tongue. Uh, I think that is, that is absurd. Uh, you are gonna contaminate the, 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 the area with oral flora. There may be cause some some permanent damage to the, to the speech, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think the thigh is a very reliable and easy area to get to. It doesn't interfere with the movements of the surgeons that are controlling the carotid. And that's, that's what I recommend. So even if you have not prepped it, it, it's easy to just throw some betadine or some antiseptive, antiseptic solution over the thigh and make an incision and get muscle in a very quick fashion. And if you have the ability to get electrophysiologic monitoring, we use SSCPs and EGs in some of these patients. So other things that you can use, let me see if I can put the sound in this one. That's a Doppler, that's a Doppler um, probe. And, and basically, I like the Doppler a lot because it gives you live information. So when we use a navigation, we're using information from the films, from the imaging that was taken before the surgery. So especially if you have to go into the infratemporal fossa or the parapharyngeal space where the soft tissue uh, has changed, uh, maybe that carotid is not in the same position as it was when you took the imaging. But the, 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 the Doppler probe 
uh, will give you live information. It will give you immediate information. Uh, and of course, it's much more um, cost, less costly than, than a navigation system. You can get a, a Doppler probe for $500. And of course, a navigation system is going to be a minimum of 50000 And that's for a very simple system. We also have available uh, ultrasound probes. And with the ultrasound, not only we can hear the carotid, but we can actually see it. Using the Doppler effect, you can actually see the vessel and, and see whether it's the carotid or a sinus. You can calculate the distance between the, the tumor that you're taking out to the carotid, et cetera, et cetera. It, it is not perfect. Uh, it's still not that easy to use through the nose. It's still not that easy to get used to the images. The images are very thin. Uh, nonetheless, I think that this is something that will continue to improve in the future. So let me show you a few, a few instances of injury of the carotid. Let me repeat that one uh, so you can see it better. Uh, this, this is with the use of a micro debrider. And of course, I don't know what the surgeon was thinking in there. I was completely disoriented and he puts the micro debrider in the carotid and you see the end result of that. By the way, these are not my cases. These are cases of different people around the world that I, they have facilitated their videos. Here's another good one. Uh, the surgeon likes to cauterize the cella before opening the cella. So they have cauterized the, the area of the cella and he's taking out the bone. And when they go lateral, boom, it gets into the carotid. Well, the electrocautery not only cauterized the bone and the mucosa, it also cauterized the, the carotid in the, in, the, in the back. And when they took the bone out, Basically, the carotid exploded. This is, uh, sorry about that. Let's just give me a second. Um, this is a Kerrison Rondure injury, and there you have it. Uh, that's the injury of the paracellar carotid. That's actually a fairly common type of injury, use of the Rondure in, in an aggressive fashion. Uh, here's another Kerrison Rondure, it's basically a repeat. Uh, of the same thing. I'm not going to dwell on that. Here's one that is interesting because this is the removal of some bony fragments. Here you have the surgeons trying to remove that bony fragment, it, it, which is moving in a similar fashion to a gasket seal that has been popularized by other surgeons. And there they move the bone into the carotid and you have the end result of that. Ultrasonic device. Uh, I like this video a lot because uh, I, many of these companies that sell you these instruments, they tell you that they are completely safe to use, that they, you will never injure a, vein, a, a vessel or a cranial nerve. Well, that's not true. Nothing is really foolproof. Uh, here's one of our cases. This is our case. Uh, here we're drilling and we're drilling in the usual fashion. And here we have a venous bleeding that all of a sudden turns arterial. And what's happening here is that we got into the into the plexus around the carotid uh, that, that looks like a venous, venous bleeding at the beginning, but it was not. It's a carotid injury that is in the canal. Uh, you can see here that it's still under control. We don't lose visualization. That patient actually ended up losing about 400 cc's for the entire thing, but nonetheless, it's not something you want to do. Here's another one of our cases. This is a case of a mucopidermoid carcinoma, and we know that we, or we knew that we were very close to the carotid. We were trying to take tumor away from the carotid and ended up in an injury. You can see the aneurysm clip over here. I'm showing you this uh, because the only, the only reason we were able to put aneurysm clips in this specimen is because we had distal and proximal control. We were doing a nasopharyngectomy and we have the carotid completely exposed. So I have seen this technique. Uh, if there's even a model that, that uses this technique uh, to teach you how to control the carotid. Well, I have to tell you, you're not gonna be able to do that until you take the carotid completely out of the bone. Uh, and by the time you do that, you probably have lost liters of blood and maybe the patient hasn't survived your attempt to do that. <clears throat> so, Again, make sure that blood is available, make sure that uh, you have a, a, an area for muscle, because that's really how you're gonna stop the carotid as, as, I'm gonna, as I'm gonna explain in just a second. So if it happens, you have to call everybody's attention, especially 
maybe the, the anesthesiologist, your anesthetist is behind the drapes and they may not be aware that you have a problem. And you have at the same time to remain calm. You are the captain of the ship and you are the ones who have to stop the balloon. So uh, for all C ENTs, uh, nasal packing, if you are by yourself, is an option if uh, the dura is not exposed. Okay, if the dura has not been opened, you can pack the nose and uh, try to transfer that patient to uh, in the interventional suite and that will be okay. Uh, you can save the day by doing that. If the dura has been opened, it's really not an option uh, because what will happen is that the blood is gonna track up into the brain and you're gonna have a disaster. There is not gonna be a good outcome. So if you have, nonetheless, if you have two surgeons working at the same time, the best thing is to keep the visualization. So this is not my video. This is a video from some friends. I think that this is from Chile. Uh, and I like this video for, for the, the way that you're, they're keeping the visualization. They're trying to, to categorize this, this stump of a vessel that ends up in the carotid, uh, but they keep their cool and they keep visualization at all times. And this is really what you need to do. You have to put, keep the visualization and put focal pressure on one part on the particular spot that is bleeding. Of course, resuscitation of these patients is key. Um, and again, I want to, to warn you, we love, um, we love hypotensive anesthesia in ENT. We love it for, for and it's very good for extradural tumors. When you, when you have something like this, the idea is to keep, to maintain the cerebral perfusion. If, if you uh, put the patient in, hypo, uh, in hypotension, cerebral perfusion is gonna, is, gonna, is gonna go down and you again may have a bad outcome because you are, your patient is gonna stroke. Uh, the other uh, thing to consider, I'm not gonna talk too much about this. These are things that are in the literature that again is very difficult to use in real life. A rapid blood infuser, unless you have it ready to go in the OR, it takes some time to mount it. You don't have that time, carotid neck compression, it's difficult to do for the same reasons that it's difficult to harvest the muscle from the sternocleidomastoid mu muscle. Uh, it's just hard to get in between the other two surgeons that are trying to control the carotid. So non-hypotensive anesthesia. And the other one that is counterintuitive is to give heparin to the patient. And the idea of the heparin is to protect the patient against embolic phenomenon. Uh, that will happen because you have damaged the intima of the carotid. Uh, and of course, next you have to stop the bleeding. To stop the bleeding, I'm gonna show you, this is a, mo a sheep model from PJ Wormel. So he has developed this model using live sheep where they make a hole in the carotid and you have this plastic face over the, the carotid and you have to stop it. And you can see here that is very, very similar to what you see in real life in the operating room. Uh, but from that model, we learned a few things. Number one, there's always one side that bleeds more than the other. There's always one side where you can put the scope and stay away from the blood better than the other. So put it on that side. Uh, the, of course, having some, something to clean your lens, whether it's irrigation or one of these endoscopes is also very useful. <clears throat> the use of large bore suctions, minimum of a 12. If you have 14 French, it's even better. And you don't dip the suction in the blood, you basically hover the suction all over the blood so it doesn't get stuck. And then you apply the muscle uh, right where, the, the, where it's bleeding. And I tend to, to get a big piece of muscle, something that you, is not a really small plug. And that's why we prefer the, the, the thigh. And as you see there, that's the, the case that I showed you before with the drill injury. And that's the application of the muscle patch. And the, it's not again magical. You have to wait there for, for 30 minutes or so until this stops. All the things that you have listed here, they, they don't work very well. A flow seal can actually be a disaster. I have seen at least three medical legal cases where the surgeon had a bleed from arterial bleed and they tried to, to stop it with flow seal and they push flow seal into the vessel uh, de de leading to a massive stroke on the patient because the flow seal went in the arterial circulation. Now, uh, 
Well, similar results to the muscle uh, muscle patch has been reported for fat, muscling go, gauze, and complex polysaccharides. Actually, we have used we have used this in, in at least one patient. It works very well, but it's difficult to apply. The muscle is easier. By the way, muscle is uh, crushed muscle. So you get your muscle, you crush it, and then you apply it to the defect. And then after you have done that, even you have topped the bleeding. Uh, it's ideal to transfer this patient to the angiography suite because they're the ones that ultimately are going to take care of the problem. Um, and this, this currently, the idea is to try to preserve the flow of the carotid, and they do that with a variety of, of, um, of devices. They can use stents, cover stents, or they can use pipelines. Uh, but if they, cannot, if they can, cannot recover the carotid, they will have to sacrifice it. And after that, if they are able to do that, uh, they they're going to anticoagulate the patient with aspirin and or Plavix. And it's important that this patient is, is followed in an ICU in the intensive care unit. So you can control the blood pressure. You can, you can follow them uh, with the anticoagulation very, very, uh, con in a very controlled fashion. And then uh, about a week to two weeks later, perform a delayed angiography. And the, the reason for the delayed angiography is to identify uh, complications from the injury that are not apparent in the acute uh, time, uh, the formation of pseudoaneurysms or formation of carotid cavernous fistula. So I'm gonna skip through this one for the sake of time. Uh, again, this, this is something we published in the literature and, and this particular paper not only talks about the technique of how to stop the carotid, what other things that sometimes they, they don't get discussed, uh, how to keep the, the OR staff in line, how to keep your lines and your suction canisters open, uh, how to monitor the patient after the injury, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so uh, going to the, to the last part of the, of the talk, orbital complications, and I'm gonna talk mainly about the, the incidence of blindness after, after orbital injury. Uh, you can have blindness from direct injury to the nerve or direct injury to the vessels that supply the nerve or the retina. And unfortunately, if you have this type of situation, it, it's not much to do. It's going to be a permanent damage. Uh, in, the, in our world of ENT, the most common scenario is that we actually have increased intraocular pressure, uh, probably from a hematoma. So here you have an example of the direct injury to a nerve. And uh, this is a, an unfortunate case that uh, happened uh, to some colleagues elsewhere. And you can see, let me repeat it for you. They are in the planum sphenoidalis. So you have optic nerve in this area, optic nerve in the other one. And they're trying to drill the planum, planum sphenoidale. And this is done by a trainee. Uh, and unfortunately, this happened so fast that they were, the, the attending in question was not able to, to stop. So here, you see that paste over there? Unfortunately, that was the optic nerve. Um, so in, in the, our ENT world, it's more likely to happen one of this. So you're using a micro breather, all of a sudden close to the orbit, and here you have the fat. And you have fat in the back. Oh, the surgeon uh, realizes that. It takes a second or two uh, to realize that the micro breather is, is pulling the fat, and it, it stops. And if you stop there, it's very unlikely that something bad is gonna happen. You have fat herniating, you can try to push it back and cauterize it a little bit, and that will be the end of that. But if you don't recognize that that has happened, uh, that's gonna be a problem. The other thing that I want to show you is, is that the surgeon at no time really penetrated the orbit. Uh, so the defect is there, and the micro breather, because he has suction, it will push, pull the fat out for you. So look at it again, Look at the position of the macro reader, the position of the orbit, and yet you have all that fat coming out. So the micro reader loves the fat and of the orbit and loves the brain. It will do the same with both. It will suck it completely in. So if you have a, a patient that complains of blindness for whichever reason in the post-operative period or complains or, or you maybe you want to check out the patient because one of these happened, uh, you should start by checking the perception of the color red. If the patient cannot perceive the color red, that should be considered an afferent defect. The color, the, the, the washout of the color red is a very early sign, actually the most early sign of an afferent defect. 
The other thing you can do is shine a light on the, on the pupils and look for the consensual reflex. And in the normal consensual reflex, we all know that you shine the light and the pupil gets smaller and the contralateral eye, the pupil will get smaller too. In, in the pa patient with an afferent injury, in optic nerve injury, when you shine the light on the pupil, the pupil may dilate and the contralateral pupil will dilate too. Now, that's a classical Marcus Gon defect. However, anything that is different from this, the normal consensual reflex should be considered a positive Marcus Gon. So maybe the, the, this one dilates and this one doesn't, maybe this one just doesn't dilate but doesn't constrict, that's also a positive Marcus Gon. And that patient should be observed. If you have an obvious hematoma, uh, what, what do, would we do? Well, uh, if you have packing, I would remove the packing. I'd rather deal with a nosebleed than with an orbital hematoma that is causing compression of the optic nerve. Uh, there are some, some advocates in the literature for massage. Uh, I don't know if that really works that well. Uh, the idea is to redistribute the blood in the cone. Well, the cone ha it has the, all these different compartments that are separate uh, by fairly sturdy tissues. So probably it won't do too much. It won't redistribute. But at the very least, it gives you something to do while you get, get your, your thoughts in order. If you have a, a high blood pressure, stabilize it. If you have a coagulopathy, of course, correct it. And if you have one of these guys close by, an oculoplastic surgeon, they are very useful. If you don't have one of those, and I know that is rare in other parts that is not in the US, uh, and if you have an ophthalmologist, you can bring him into the room and ask him to, to measure the, the pressure of the eye. They will have no idea what, how to help you, but they do know how to measure the pressure of the eye. And that's something that is useful to have that information. If the pressure is from more than 25, uh, you know that you should decompress that eye in some way. And my favorite way to do it is really with a lateral cantotomy and cantolysis. Uh, you can also decompress the eye by removing the medial orbit and the, the lamina of apparition and then opening the fascia. But for the money, uh, I like this better because it's faster and it doesn't leave any sequela. You would think that it was cause is some cosmetic defect, but it doesn't. This heals completely well by secondary intention. You don't even have to suture it at the end. The idea of this is that you divide the can lateral cantus and then you look for the tendon of the, of the inferior eyelid and you divide it too. So the reason to do this is really to get be able to get to the tendon in a in a easy fashion. Again, the compression is effective, uh, but the problem is that probably after you do this, the the patient is going to be in ophthalmic, uh, and that's going to be visible. So I would like to have something without sequela. So last uh, but not least, the the complications that we see at the nose. I'm not going to say too much on this, <coughs> just to say that we do see. Is, is, is very predictable that the sinonasal quality of life is gonna deteriorate for a number of months. Uh, so the patients may be anosmic, the patients will have crossing, uh, nasal crossing of course disappears in most of our patients after three months, especially if you don't have any raw bone exposed. Uh, the, and of course, if the more dissection you need and the more bone you leave exposed, the more that crossing is gonna last. Olfactory functions follows a similar trend. Our incidence of, of permanent anosmia is less than 1% in, in our patients, uh, but they are anosmic uh, for some period of time, usually again, about six to, to, six to 12 weeks, and then it recovers. Uh, if we measure them at a year, uh, almost all the patients have recovered their olfaction to, uh, to before the surgery status or even better. So to, to end, uh, I think that you should proceed with caution. Uh, endoscopic scopic surgery has a steep learning curve. They, we have the same risk of neural and vascular injury as they, as they open approaches, but we have to develop skills to deal with them in a different way than what we deal with in the open approaches. And of course, uh, reconstructive challenges, we're still dealing with the CSF leaks. I think that we have not solved that dilemma completely. It, it comes back uh, to haunt us. Uh, and the, again, the problem of, uh, of endoscopic, sinus, endoscopic scope of surgery is that it is very technology dependent. So we, have, we can have technological complications in, this, in the sense that if your device stops working, uh, your monitor is, stops working, 
uh, maybe uh, you cannot continue the surgery. And uh, sometimes you have to be as prepared as possible. Uh, and just sometimes you just need a little bit of luck to be able to get out of these complications or not to get into a more complex complication. As I always say, it's better to be lucky than good. So I think we're gonna stop here, maybe entertain any questions you may have and, um, and any, any comments that anybody may have. Thank you, Dr. Cajal. It was an amazing presentation. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't have the audio. Could you- oh, okay. No, that's no problem. Uh, thank you. It was an amazing presentation, very complete. Uh, I'll ask for a couple of our attendants to ask some questions or comment. First, I'd like to ask for Dr. Luciano. He's an affiliate professor here in Federal University of Sao Paulo to comment or if you have any questions. All right. Uh, great talk, Dr. Cajal. It was uh, a great seeing your videos and all your experience. Um, I have a question about CSF leaks. If you see a patient like a woman uh, around 40s and you know that uh, it, that's the patient that uh, could get recurrence of the CSF, right? So do you uh, perform the CSF closure and that's it? Or do you prepare patients uh, if you know that it could recur with a lumbar drain or uh, anything special for this type of patients? Yeah, so it is in my in my world. It's very common to have a morbidly obese patient. So uh, we we look for signs of of possible uh, intracranial hypertension. So if you have an empty cella, if you have optic nerves that are dilated, ventricles that are big, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, you may suspect that that patient is going to give you trouble in the post op. Uh, and in that part, that's a that's a that's a rare scenario. Nonetheless, we see it once in a while. If that is the case, we do repeat, we do uh, perform the surgery. If we have a CSF leak, we repair it. But what we do is, in 48 hours later, we do a lumbar puncture. And if the patient has high pressure, at that point, I may either put her on Diamox and repeat the lumbar puncture on Diamox to make sure that it's effective or go to a shunt. Uh, and that decision making is usually more, more made with a neurosurgeon because they're the ones who put the shunt and they're the ones who, who deal with the consequences of that and with the patient. Uh, but that's more or less what we follow uh, as a philosophy. If the patient is big, yeah, we, we suspect, I mean, we know that they will have a higher incidence of CSF leak, <clears throat> but we don't put a prophylactic lumbar drain. We stopped doing that some times ago. Uh, and that's because the drains have their own morbidity and, and, and sometimes even their own mortality. And, um, and drains on these obese people is, are difficult, are not an easy thing to do. Many times you have to do it on their floro, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, Overall, we just don't do it. All right. Thank you very much for. So Thank that you. again, it's a, little, it's a little bit similar to the patient that comes with an idiopathic leak. That yeah. that is a that's that's a different population because those those are already leaking spontaneously. Those those have declared themselves, uh, and those we follow more or less the same protocol. We repair it, and 24 to 48 hours later, we repeat the lumbar lumbar puncture and then follow the same type of a scenario. But, but the chance of needing, of needing something is much higher. Okay. Oh, great. So the problem that I have once was uh, the bone was very uh, like a poor, like a sponge. And I had... Uh, we are. Uh, I think we are okay now. So the the problem that I had, the, the bone was like a sponge, and the the, the patient itself doesn't have a, like IMR, a troubled MRI, of empty cella, or anything. But once I got in this sinus, sinus, the bone was always spongy and with uh, several uh, leaks, not just one that I was expecting at the time. Like sometimes it got this this kind of a uh, 
uh, this connection between the, 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 the CTs before pre-op and the, the actual visualization of the leak when you got any, when you see it. I think your audio is off, Dr. Carl. It is. Yeah, there we go. Great, yeah. yeah. I said that I have seen that type of, of patient where the bone looks more like a filter than than bone itself. Yeah, you can get caught on that situation. I, I think that I'm, I'm not very dogmatic about this. I mean, we have gone through an evolution of things. And remember what, what I tell you, you should not take it as dogma. You should take it as, as my experience. And this is how I do it in Columbus, Ohio. It may not be the best idea to do it everywhere. Uh, so you, you have to adapt to your circumstances. And I'm, for example, uh, I, I don't go to any, any other hospital. I just work here and my neurosurgeon is there. We see each other every day. Uh, so that type of availability and that type of not having to worry about, uh, I'm gonna be in a different town tomorrow is not reality for many people. So you have to to, to do the things that work for you. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cajal. Uh, now I'd like to ask Dr. Rodrigo. He's our ENT head of the school-based surgery team to ask any questions or comment about the presentation, please. So again, thank you for your lecture. It was very nice as usual. And uh, so I'm sorry you have to see our neurosurgeon every day. I have to see mine every week and it's already too much. <laughs> just kidding. Okay, so I, I just wrote a question. I'd like two quick things uh, about the carotid injury. Uh, I had a personal experience with another surgeon, which is not the one I'm using to do surgery. And that's uh, something that is already tricky. And uh, it was a very small one. We could control, finish surgery. It was a great scenario patient went down straight to the angiography and the angiography team and the neurosurgeon decided for a uh, flow diverter, uh, something like a pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, I had no experience whatsoever with coils or the uh, flow diverter. I thought it was very nice because the carotid was still flowing Probably. afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I wasn't aware. Uh, afterwards, uh, I heard a lot of uh, opinions against it, that we should have closed it for good with coils because it's not safe for the first few weeks, months. So I don't know what you think about that. Anyway, this particular patient was okay after months. He's still okay, but uh, is it really something that we should avoid? And uh, once you have uh, an injury, we should go for a complete closure of the carotid? No, it's, I think that preserving the flow is the best option. So that what happens with the pipeline, the pipeline is a mesh, right? It looks like a like chicken wire. Uh, it just wires exactly like that. So you sometimes they put two or three of them to decrease the holes in between, uh, but it's a still, it's still open. So you cannot put those and then take the packing out the patient will exsanguinate because the blood will come out through that mesh. So you have to have, uh, it takes about seven to 10 days for, for them to form a layer and close off completely. So in that sense, you are, you are correct. It's, it's, not, it's not a cover stent, uh, which is the other option. Sometimes they can put a cover stent, but the problem is that the cover stent is very stiff. So a cover stent, they can put it in the parapharyngeal carotid, uh, yeah, maybe in the in the in the petrous carotid, but to put it in the paracellar is not going to work. It doesn't take the the turns. So they have these pipelines that work really very well. I mean, it's, they use this for aneurysms and pseudo aneurysms all the time, all the time. But you have to to understand what they are trying to do, and uh, so the expectations have to be different. But it's absolutely true. Uh, that, for example, all the, the, all the patients that we have had, they either have had a pipeline or, or a sacrifice because they were not able to put anything, anything more. Uh, but uh, the, the pipeline, we keep the muscle or whatever we had and the packing in place for 10 days and we take the packing out in the operating room. 
to make sure that the patient is not going to bleed. Um, sometimes you do have to sacrifice it when, when there's not possible to preserve the flow. Uh, but the incidence of a stroke after a sacrifice is significant. And that, that, that incidence of a stroke continues for a few years. Okay, thank you. So can I do another quick question, Jonathan? Yeah. You're my <laughs> boss. To monopolize. You, you, you very very quick one. You're my boss. <laughs> very quick one. Go ahead. Um, we have currently a patient in our infirmary, uh, a regular pituitary macroadenoma. She was operated elsewhere for her first surgery. And our impression for the image is that they didn't, they didn't really get to the tumor. Unfortunately, it's something that we see around here. And they left a huge bone defect in the sphenoidal plane area and posterior mm -hmm. etymoidal area, but it's completely covered with uh, nasal mucosa and uh, dura, whatever. So she didn't have a leak. And uh, she came for us for her second procedure. The tumor was there. And um, when we removed the tumor, there was a small leak. And I think it was plugged with tumor. When we removed the tumor, we saw the leak. Probably there was a defect from the first surgery in the sphenoidal plan area. But the, the thing is, we've seen it before, but this one is very tricky. There is no bone around for a large amount of space. We have dura and uh, sphenoidal mucosa, which yeah. we move, but then we didn't know what to do. We enlarged it a lot to have bone. So we did something that we were not uh, comfortable with. We put a free flap because her uh, nasal septum was also with a large perforation. There was no uh, septal flap possibility. So I didn't go for a lateral nasal wall flap. I went for a free graft of middle turbinates. We were not uh, very happy about that. And now after six days, she's like, probably she has a CSF leak. That's the, our last uh, information. So we are coming back for closing it. And I'm still not sure what to do. Like yeah. there's no bone in the whole sinoidal area. Fine. Yeah. So it, it depends on where in the planum is going to be. Um, you, if it is anterior planum, a short nasoceptal flap will do it. So maybe even with the perforation, you can still get one. Uh, you can do a lateral nasal wall flap. Um, if it is posterior planum, you can obliterate this, the sphenoid with fat. That's likely to work too. Uh, so any of those probably will do it. If it is very anterior in the planum, uh, you, you need a flap of some kind. If you're graft, I would have done the same. I would have grafted it, by the way. Um, but if the graft is not working and it's very anterior, you, you need a flap of some kind. So I would either use lateral wall or, or some type of modified nasoceptal. Okay. Thank you. No more questions. <laughs> <Nice>. Good luck. <laughs> Let me know how it goes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodrigo. Uh, now I'd like to call uh, Dr. Samuel. He is the head of the neurosurgery team of the skull based surgery in our institution. Please, Dr. Samuel. Hi, Ricardo. Very nice to see you here. Nice to see you again. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for such a nice uh, speech. Uh, wonderful. I'm, I'm the guy that uh, Rodrigo doesn't like to see every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> just, just a question for you. I, I'd like to hear from you, your critical view about the coagulation attempts on the carotid lesions. Yeah. Uh, of course, you showed a lot. Uh, there are yeah. always some attempts, but you, you think it's worthy or, no. or, 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 or we, we have always uh, to try to... to to, to tamponate, to pack, and uh, you think it, it's the best way or is worthy to, to coagulate sometimes? Well, let, let me give you my bias answer, right? After, after dealing with at least four or five different neurosurgeons, seven or eight different carotid injuries in, in different ways. Uh, if you have a true carotid injury, not, not really an injury of a vessel coming off the carotid, that you have a little branch and you have a stump. If you have a true carotid injury, 
go for muscle. Okay, forget about everything else. Coagulating it, if you actually seal it, that meant that, mean that you thrombose the carotid. That, that's really what it means. Uh, you, you thrombose the carotid, you form a clot there, and that's not gonna be, it's a matter of, you are leaving it to, to uh, mother luck to what, the, what is gonna happen to that patient. Um, and we have done it. So I'm telling you because we have seen the, the results and seen the experience. Um, putting clips on the carotid, as I mentioned, don't, don't attempt it unless you already have distal and proximal control. Otherwise, it's gonna take you a good 30 to 60 minutes to, to get the bone out. And in the meantime, you're gonna lose a lot of blood. And, and you're gonna put that patient in a, in a big, uh, at a big risk. Um, it, it just get the muscle as soon as you can, pack it in there. Uh, if, it, if, the, if the carotid is inside this canal, you don't even have to hold it in, in place. You can put it in there and pack behind. If the carotid is outside the canal, you have to hold it in there by yourself. Oh. Because if you pack it, you're gonna compress the carotid and you can have other, other problems. But if it is a hole through the bone and the carotid is there, just put the muscle in there, take that patient to the interventional radiology suite and let him deal with the issue in a more permanent fashion. That, that is my bias after seeing all kinds of crazy attempts at, at, at repairing this. Yeah. Um, if you have a little branch that is coming off, like, like the guys that I showed you before, that is a little branch coming, uh, and you can attempt to coagulate it. Uh, but you, you need a stump. If you're going to coagulate it directly in the carotid, it's not going to be good. It's just not going to be good. OK, perfect. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Dr. No, no, no tongue no Moscow. No tongue <laughs> Moscow. No tongue. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Cajal, Dr. Samuel. Uh, I'd like to, to ask uh, Dr. Francisco, who is a neurosurgeon trained here in our institution at Federal University of Sao Paulo. And he spent some time with you in Pittsburgh. I'd like to ask him if he has any questions or comments, please. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Dr. Corral. Good to see you again, sir. Hi, Chico. How are you doing? It's a wonderful lecture. Good uh, to see you. Very good to see you again. And uh, thank you for, for your time and for this wonderful lecture again. I'd, I'd like to congratulate my friends uh, from the Department of ENT in Sao Paulo for making this happen. It's, it's very good to be among friends. And I'd like to ask your uh, opinion, your experience, for, especially for those patients with high risk uh, a high risk for intraoperative carotid uh, ICA injury. For example, for patients with recurrent chordomas, recurrent chondrosarcs, previously radiated tumors, what do you think of preoperative endovascular treatment to place intraarterial stents to reinforce the, the wall of the carotid? So what do you think about that? Do you have any experience? And I'd uh, like to hear from you about that. Very little. Uh, I, I think that is worth considering doing it. Especially, for example, a recurring chordoma has been proton beamed, uh, so yeah. rated before. Uh, that, that is, we have a, 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 a nightmare case with that one. Um, it is something to consider. Now, if you're going to consider that and they're going to put pipelines or, or stents, depends again on the place, remember that that patient is going to be receiving double antiplatelet therapy for a while. That's true. Uh -huh. So people have talked about only four weeks. I'm not too sure about that. Uh, I, I, think that I think that it's going to be at least six to 12 weeks of anticoagulation before you can touch that patient again. Uh, and that's pushing it. So that, that's going to be the limiting factor. Uh, the, the, so do you need to operate the patient quickly or can you wait two months? If you can wait two months, then it's an option. If you cannot wait two months, then it's not an option. Unfortunately, most of the patients we see, we don't think we can wait because they always come I with see. cranial nerve injuries and, and you want to, for them to have the chance of recovery, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, we have used it, not for chordomas, we have used it for, for other tumors that are benign uh, but it's, uh, it's not as frequent, in theory, it's great 
but it's not as practical as you would think. I see. So the, the matter, the major issue would be the time, the delay that you can wait yeah. to operate the page. Yeah, correct. Right. Yes, correct. That's very yeah. good. That is, that is exactly it. All right. Thank you very much. Very good to see you again. Likewise. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cajal and Dr. Francisco. Uh, Dr. Cajal, if you excuse me, I will just speak in Portuguese to ask if anyone has any more questions. Uh, alguém tem mais alguma pergunta que não queira fazer em inglês? A gente pode fazer, pode mandar pelo chat também. Alguma? Ok, so I don't think we have any more questions, Dr. Cajal. So, uh, in name of our department, I'd like to uh, thank you for this amazing presentation, for your time, and uh, it was an honor for us to have you here. If anyone has any other questions, you're free. So if not, thank you so much for your time. É um prazer. Prazer é, é compartilhar com vocês. É, muito obrigado, né? Muito obrigado. Thank you so much. Hello. Have a great night. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Boa noite. Obrigado. Boa noite. Falou.